Although I started this series promising to trace the roots of modern medicine throughout history, you'd be forgiven to think that what we've looked at so far has been pretty alien. And that's because it is. The systems of medicine in the past were quite different, and medical practice was also quite different. Although I'm sure you could see little hints of things that would bring us to the modern day. However, as we enter the early modern period, which is roughly 1500 to 1800, we'll see how things slowly start to get to what we're more familiar with. That isn't to say that by 1800 medicine was fully fledged out to the way that we would be comfortable with, but it was getting there. With that being said, however, early modern medicine is far more than just a stepping stone between the medieval and the contemporary. It's very interesting in and of itself. So for now, let's take the time to take a look at early modern medicine in its own right, starting with the Renaissance. Although the emphasis when discussing the Renaissance tends to be towards change, it should be remembered that it was also a time of much continuation with the Middle Ages. In fact, the point at which the Middle Ages ends is up for debate, and the Renaissance can be seen as a movement or period of transition between the medieval and modern worlds encompassing and overlapping with both of them. It should be no surprise then that the Renaissance saw a continuation of what was going on in the late Middle Ages, and in many ways medicine remained the same. However, it's also undeniable that changes were taking place at the same time. As we saw in the last video, medieval physicians and intellectuals had always been interested in the works of antiquity, especially after the so-called 12th century Renaissance, when many classical works were translated into Latin from Arabic. However, the more famous renaissance of the late 15th to the 17th century pushes this to the extreme. Although medieval thinkers often admitted that the ancients were their intellectual superiors, renaissance thinkers, tied to humanist philosophy, believed that they could bring their world back to the glory days of Greece and Rome. As a consequence, they also began to feel that everything which had happened between antiquity and their own time was backwards and corrupt beginning the long history of disdain for this middle age between antiquity and modernity. As a medievalist, I could rant about this all day, but I'll spare you that for now. In medicine, this meant that many intellectuals, though by no means all of them, sought to purge Galenic medicine from any post-classical innovations. The works of medieval Christian authors were rejected in favor of the pure Hippocrates and Galen, which was easier as new ancient texts were brought into the West and translated directly from the Greek. New translations were also made of texts which had been available for centuries, again based on the Greek editions rather than the Arabic, seeing medieval translations as barbaric and corrupt. Likewise, Muslim authors like Ibn Sina, long considered one of the wisest of physicians, were also rejected, though not without much debate, and they often remained a part of the university curriculum, at least for a while. And yet, it didn't take long before this view could no longer be fully tenable. As I mentioned last time, ever since the Black Death, it had become clear that the ancients didn't know everything, and this view grew more prominent as other diseases appeared in Europe for the first time, such as syphilis, which was thought to have come from the New World, and the infamous English sweat, which ravaged that country from 1485 to 1551. In fact, it's telling that these diseases were seen as new at all, rather than being fit into traditional categories and given traditional names known to the ancients. They were also very clearly contagious, something which seemed to go against the classical view that epidemics were caused by bad airs. This didn't cause a rejection of miasmic theories about disease, however, as it was simply thought that these particular diseases had some sort of infectious property, even as others were still thought to be brought on by miasma. Rising colonialism and global trade also made it difficult to simply remain married to classical pharmacological works such as that of Dioscorides, as exotic plants and animals were being brought back to Europe from all corners of the globe, and they were quickly placed into the traditional categories of hot, cold, wet, and dry, making them viable for diet and drugs. This was the case for tobacco, which was observed by the Spaniard Nicolás Monardes to be used by indigenous peoples for healing. He brought some of it back to Europe and attributed to it the qualities of hot and dry. Many at this time believed that the best and most effective plants were those to be found around one's home, or at least in one's homeland. But 
there were more and more Europeans at this point who were living in faraway lands. And the dominant view at the time was that one's constitution was shaped by where they lived rather than their race, which was a concept that only really emerged later on. So these plants could be more effective for them. And of course, exoticism had its own appeal, and many swore by the curative properties of hard to get and expensive products, whether they were patients or doctors. One thing which continued on from the Middle Ages was the gradual increase in the interest in anatomy and anatomical books. In the Middle Ages, all but the most costly books would have been relatively bare, with maybe some basic images to abstractly show the Galenic systems of the body. However, the new printing press made books not only cheaper and more widespread overall, but it also meant that woodcuts and later metal engravings could be printed with exact detail again and again. The growth in anatomy had drawn the attention of artists, like famously Leonardo da Vinci, who studied it themselves in order to produce detailed anatomical drawings, some of which wound up being printed. In turn, this increased the popularity of anatomy in an upward spiral. This made it easier and easier for anatomists to get bodies to dissect from authorities, and this in turn led to even more changes. You see, in much of the Middle Ages, the authority of figures like Galen often trumped what one observed themselves. If the two didn't match, it was assumed that you must have done something wrong, and people rarely dissected enough bodies to be sure that it wasn't just a fluke. But by the time Berengario da Carpi was dissecting, more bodies were available, and Berengario was confident that one ought to trust one's own senses over what was written in old books. He had discovered that the network of blood vessels at the base of the head, known as the Rete Mirabile, which Galen noted was where arterial blood became psychic pneuma, didn't actually exist in humans, although it did in cows. As new translations of Galen made it increasingly clear that his dissections were animal rather than human, it became even more clear that there was a gap in knowledge that needed to be filled. This wasn't necessarily a rejection of Galen either, as many pointed out that Galen himself promoted observation from the senses. Many simply saw themselves as fulfilling Galen's quest, a clear indication that the Renaissance humanists saw themselves to be on par with the ancients. Anatomy began to change as more and more errors were found in Galen's works. Andreas Vesalius, the son of Charles V's pharmacist, proudly pointed out Galen's mistakes in his massive 1541 work on the fabric of the human body, which he claimed to be the first ever complete human anatomy. He also loudly criticized the education system which stuck to old books, and he became a very popular professor of anatomy at the University of Padua, perhaps the only one to perform dissections himself rather than reading Galen while a surgeon did so, as was traditionally done. Despite its growing popularity, which we've mentioned in the past, anatomy had still remained peripheral in medicine, but Vesalis' own popularity would help make it a more central part of medical education and interest. Out of all the anatomical discoveries of the time, however, there's one which would definitely have the biggest impact, and that was the discovery in the 1620s of the circulation of the blood by William Harvey. Whereas Galen had believed blood was consumed by the body, Harvey, seeing how much blood flowed out of the heart, questioned how the body could replace so much of it if this were the case. He did an experiment, tying a tight ligature around his arm to cut the flow of blood through his veins and arteries. He then loosened it enough for blood to flow to the arteries while still cutting off the veins. When doing this, he observed that the veins below the ligature bulged with blood, and not the ones closer to the body, showing that blood entered the veins from the arteries at the extremities and not from the liver, thus also showing that they were connected in a single system rather than in two separate ones as Galen thought. For many, this marked the final nail in the coffin for Galenic medical theory, but not for Harvey himself. He was as conservative as could be, acting as a censor in England who prosecuted unlicensed practitioners and those accused of malpractice. He was a staunch Galenist, seeing his work as building upon Galen and still perceiving the heart as warming the blood, giving it active spirit, which would then be transferred throughout the body before the dull, cold, unspirited blood returned to the veins to be warmed again. According to John Aubrey, Harvey referred on one occasion to followers of new philosophies as shit breaches. 
But regardless of Harvey's opinions, these new philosophies did emerge, both before his time and after it. They began with people like Paracelsus, who proposed a radically new view of the body based on alchemical processes. Although Paracelsus is sometimes called the father of modern chemistry, it should be recalled that his view of the world was extremely mystical and also emphasized astral influence, and was connected to growing magical and esoteric ideas such as Kabbalah and Hermeticism. Still, the idea that alchemical processes took place in the body did become popular, even if those who adopted it rejected the other aspects of Paracelsus' worldview, and the search for chemical cures grew. There was also an emerging view of the body in an extremely mechanical fashion, promoted by philosophers such as René Descartes, who referenced Harvey's discoveries and saw the heart as a mechanical pump, while others described the arms as pulleys and measured movements based on mathematical principles. These mechanical views were strongly connected to the scientific revolution, where observation was king and the quantification of everything in nature was desired. People like Isaac Newton saw the world as made up of laws, and many sought to discover the laws of the body just as much as the laws of thermodynamics. Scientific institutions were established, like the Académie Royale in France and the Royal Society in England, which were independent of often conservatively Galenic physicians' colleges, and it included medical knowledge in a larger scientific purview. By the time Enlightenment philosophy was in full swing, the scientific understanding of the body and the conquest of disease were both seen as an integral part of the emancipation of humanity and the quest for liberty. By the 18th century, new theories of the body emerged to explain disease. Hermann Boerhaave saw the body as a system of pipes and tubes which allowed for the flow of fluids with disease emerging when there were blockages or stagnation, whereas William Cullen saw bodily functions as being due to the excitement of bodily fibers, with disease being when these fibers were disturbed, leading them to either be overly excited or not excited enough. Some of these ideas became immensely popular, but there was never the consensus that Galenism held. The scientific world was divided, with new universities in Northern Europe often being centers of certain views though most thinkers held complex and multifaceted ideas about the body rather than falling into clearly defined factions. However, most of what we've been talking about so far has been concerned with theory. Medical practice, on the other hand, changed very little from the Middle Ages. Most theories still relied upon the concept of the six non-naturals, and medical practice largely retained the ancient hierarchy of diet, drugs, and surgery. Food continued to be defined by the four ancient qualities, and remained one aspect of a larger healthy lifestyle. We can see this in the introduction of citrus fruits into the diets of sailors to combat scurvy, as it was rarely the fruits alone which was thought to do the trick, but rather a larger regimen governing the sailors' daily activities and lifestyles in which citrus was only one part. Classical purgatives and other drugs also remained popular, with new ones being added but not replacing the old. The increase in available drugs did have an effect on the role of the apothecary, however, although in the past they'd always been seen as merely the supplier of drugs prescribed by physicians, though in reality they often suggested their own cures independently, which annoyed many a doctor. By the 18th century, they became organized into pharmacist guilds, which gave them increased legitimacy and connections, again to the annoyance of many doctors. By the end of the 18th century, research had begun into new therapies based around newly understood concepts such as gas and electricity, but these would only really catch on in the 1800s. The only really big practical development of the early modern period was the introduction of inoculation, the practice of exposure of someone to a small amount of infected tissue in order to create immunity to that disease after a relatively minor infection. This had been practiced in many parts of the world, but was brought to the attention of Western medical elites by Lady Mary Wortley Montagu, wife of the British consul to Constantinople, who had learned of the practice there and inoculated her children against smallpox using the scabs of an infected individual. Although there were subsequent high-profile cases of inoculation in Europe, including the daughters of George II of Britain and the family of Catherine the Great of Russia, its popularity remained small, both due to opposition of the procedure itself, and the very real danger of serious infection and outbreak, especially in urban areas. 
This later danger was mitigated when Edward Jenner introduced vaccination using the related but milder cowpox, with the word vaccine coming from the Latin vaccinus, meaning of or from the cow. Something else which didn't change a whole lot at this time was who was practicing medicine. Since the Renaissance, the number of university-trained physicians was increasing, but they were still outside the means and availability of many. Though a general increase in the quality of life and growth of what we would today call the middle class did mean a larger number could indeed afford them. Nonetheless, the medical marketplace was still alive and strong, especially as printing meant that more people could gain access to medical knowledge and more people outside the traditionally educated elite could spread their views. Religious healing remained prominent, as did empirical cures, and magical remedies from all kinds of traditions. Some returned from far-off lands claiming to have learned exotic healing arts, others passed down the knowledge they had been taught by elders of their families or the local herb woman, while others still claimed to have used the latest science to invent a miraculous cure-all, whether they themselves actually believed in it or not. Surgeons gradually gained the respect of the medical field, and their separation from barbers was largely complete by the mid-1700s, aided in no small part by high-profile cases such as the cure of Louis XIV's anal fistula by C. F. Felix in 1731. Hospitals also grew in prominence from the Middle Ages, remaining largely religious institutions with temporary medical professional visits and relying on charitable donations. By the 18th century, they became larger and more specialized, but remained by and large a place for the poor and destitute, those who couldn't receive care at home. Physicians and surgeons became more and more present, however, especially as medical education began to place a larger emphasis on practical training. On the downside, though, these hospitals were often hotbeds for outbreaks of infectious disease. The cause of such things were largely blamed on poor ventilation, based, again, on the old-fashioned view of miasmic air as one of the six non-naturals. Newer hospitals, therefore, were planned with bigger windows and better airflow, and were often established farther from cities. Some had proposed the idea that disease had some sort of seed transferred from one person to the other, but it wouldn't be until the following century that this would be readily accepted once this seed was actually proven to exist. But that will have to wait until next time. And that's going to do it for this time. I've got one more episode planned for the 19th century, so you can look forward to that coming out. Um, it's not going to be my next video, I have something else planned for that, but it should be coming out in the next few months, early 2023 at the latest, I would say. If you enjoyed this video, uh, please like and comment and subscribe to the channel. Um, this channel is actually starting to grow a little bit, which is nice to see. I, when I first posted um, my first video, I wasn't sure if anyone would wind up watching these, so it's nice to see that some people are, are getting into it. And like I said then, I do plan on making a lot more videos in the future, so stay tuned for that. For now, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.